Well, we're teaching verse by verse through the book of Revelation, and we're all the way up to Revelation 20. This is lesson 33. That is a whole lot of talking. So at least 25 plus hours in all that length of time, in all that. So nonetheless, um, you know, tonight, Revelation 20, we, tonight we're going to just cover six verses. There's just a really a lot in Revelation 20. There are doctrines that it's, it's odd, but for me as a pastor, I just got to know my MO, my modus operandi, why I do what I do. You know, it's important that you hear all of the counsel of God, not just the things I like to talk about, Right. And uh, you, need, you need to be rounded out in the word, and that's how you grow. Um, uh, Peter told believers to uh, lay aside all their personal issues and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And he said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. So, Pastor, why you teach the Bible? Because if I teach the Bible, if you'll listen and apply it, you'll grow. That's what's happened in my life over the past 44 years. And, you know, I'm still growing spiritually. Every year I look back, I can look back last year this time. I can see areas where, where I'm, I'm, I'm further along this year than it was last year. And sometimes I look back, man, if I look back 10 years, sometimes I want to hide my head in a sack. Why, how in the world could I act that way? Man, that just means you're changing. How many know if you're not changing, something's wrong? If you're not changing, you may not be alive, spiritually speaking. So nonetheless, so tonight we're going to talk about the doctrine, a couple of doctrines in this, in this chapter, Revelation 20, uh, you will find the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. That's a big deal. Revelation, listen to Hebrews 6, therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works of faith towards God of the doctrine of baptisms. This is not in my notes, I'm sorry guy, of the laying on of hands of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgments. The last part of the chapter is eternal judgments. So really interesting that you know, all through the Bible, you just find all of these things that we need to know about our past, present, and future in God. So when you come to Revelation 20, it's quite an insightful, uh, just quite an insightful chapter of the book of Revelation. So uh, let's, let's get right into it. I also need to uh, mention that if you go to Victory Church Raleigh, uh, get my notes. You can follow me. I usually don't share every single thing because just time is not always on my side for that. But and there are things tonight I won't share that are in the notes, so I always try to put something extra in there. And there's definitely a section there I'm not even going to cover tonight. So go to Victory Church Raleigh, scroll down to where it says get in the notes, click, and you'll be there. And you can follow me, and we'll go there. So in Revelation 20, Jesus has returned uh, all of the judgments against God's enemies that have usurped his authority on earth for all of the millennia of time and have warped the human race and caused uh, rebellion against God in so many ways and so many levels. All of that is over. The judgments are done. Jesus has defeated his enemies and the earth is entering into the millennial reign of Christ. Before we go there, though, uh, 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 while I was studying yesterday, uh, go, go to Dan turn over to Daniel 12. Now, now Daniel, Daniel was written during Daniel's time. Daniel lived during the, um, uh, the exile to Babylon uh, from, uh, you know, in the uh, 586 is, uh, B.C. is when the Israelites actually left Israel and went into Babylon, and they were there for 70 years. And that's the whole duration of Daniel's life. His life was in captivity and exile. And uh, so, my, that's a long time ago. What's that, 20, 20 uh, my goodness, 2,500 years ago or so. And, uh, but, but God showed Daniel something that long ago that's happening, that, that's going to be happening in our future and that we may, that, that you're going to live through. So watch this. Uh, Daniel 12, the entire chapter. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Now, Michael, the archangel, has been given, if you look at the scriptures clearly, has been given responsibility to watch over Israel. And it really could be at the very end when uh, just before Jesus comes back, and the battle of Armageddon and all the hell breaks loose when the Antichrist is revealed. He just kind of stands back. That's what it says here. That time Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Could be that he just stands and says and, and just lets whatever happen happen. And it says and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to the time, that time. 
And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Now, I think that's a reference to the book of life, don't you? Just interesting that he talks about, now we typically call this the tribulation. It's a period of, of from Daniel chapter 9, we found out that's a period of seven years. You could call it Daniel's 70th week. God showed Daniel 70 weeks of 70 years, 490 years of Israel's existence. 483 of those years have been completed. And there's seven years of Jewish time that God showed Daniel left to be fulfilled. Has not been fulfilled yet. Uh, when, when the church age began and Israel decided not to believe Jesus as Messiah, they were, uh, God just cut it off. He cut off his fellowship relation. He just cut off his dealings with them for a period of time. We've been in the ter- church age for almost 2,000 years now. And uh, when, when uh, the man called Antichrist, according to Daniel 9, 27, when he makes a peace treaty with Israel... God's time clock will start ticking again, and there will be seven years of time that are left. That's how we get that. So people typically, it's really not an accurate statement. There's nothing in the Bible that calls those whole entire seven years the tribulation, but everybody knows it that way. So if I say it any other way, it confuses people. It's literally Daniel's 70th week. There's a portion there called the Great Tribulation. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. We've talked about that in detail. Nonetheless, it's just interesting that Daniel saw this 2,500 years ago. Then verse 2 it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now we'll get into this tonight. Everybody will be resurrected, both saint and sinner alike. Every human will live in eternity in the body God gave them. Isn't that interesting? We'll look at it tonight. Watch it. Verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Could it be that the degree of light, the brightness of your personage in eternity is determined by your obedience to God now? Think about it. Wow. Wow. Verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, uh, looked, and there stood two others on the riverbank and other on, and the other on that riverbank. And one said uh, to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, he must have been up in the air, uh, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters over the river, when he held up his right hand, his left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Now, I believe he's referring there to the great tribulation. We'll get into this again tonight real quickly. Now, I won't say a lot about it, but... You know, there's a peace treaty that's going to be signed in Israel, and I need to take a little journey here. There's a lot of turmoil happening in Israel. What's going on with that? The eventuation of that really could be a terrible war in Israel that uh, encompasses um, a number of the Islamic nations that surround them. There's a lot of turmoil now. And uh, anyway, the eventuation of that could be uh, the person that the Bible calls Antichrist signing a treaty to, uh, to try to absolve the, the angst in the war and, and try to bring some peace. Can you turn my uh, volume off for, un, until I tell you to turn it back on? You can show the video, but not the volume. Tell me when it's off. Y'all, if you're online, I'll be right back. You can see me, but you won't hear what I'm about to say. You've got to come here to hear this. So you'll again have to come back here if you want to hear what I just said because I won't, I won't say that out publicly. But nonetheless, um, really interesting times. And so there's going to be a peace treaty signed at some point. And it could be signed, you know, it could be signed fairly soon. Uh, will we know it? Nah, probably. There's a chance we wouldn't know, but I think probably so if you're a spiritually attuned believer, I think you'll somehow know that that's happened. I think we'll be aware. It's going to be in the Middle East, and it's, uh, and it's again, the Islamic nations and Israel because they're just having a, a rough time. So once that happens, that stop watch, so to speak, in God's hand, it turns on, and the seven years begin. You get it? 
So I'm just saying that, get right with God. Man, seek first the kingdom. Lay up some treasures in heaven. Get ready to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Do some things. Ask God to help you, right? Bless some people, help some people, pray for people. Because if you're going to do something for God, we don't have a lot of time left, it seems. How many hear me? Nonetheless, it says here, verse 8, Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall the, it, uh, be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And then verse 11, now this is really interesting. And from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Stop right there, look at me. So, so what is the abomination of desolation? The Antichrist will make a peace treaty with Israel. And uh, things will seemingly be okay for three and a half years. Midway into that seven-year period, three and a half years into it, uh, the Jew Jews will uh, have some kind of a rustic temple rebuilt. Probably won't be fancy because they're not going to take a long time to build it. They want to, they want to present animal sacrifices to God like they did in the Old Testament. They don't believe that Jesus is Messiah. These are the Hasidic Jews. They are Messianic Jews that believe that Jesus is Messiah. And God will allow them to rebuild the temple. The Bible is very clear. The temple will be rebuilt. And, uh, and when the Antichrist comes along, it'll be there and he's going to desecrate it. Uh, that is, um, you know, maybe he'll bring a pig into it. Jews don't like pork, so I don't know. He's going to do something to aggravate them. You know, in the t- days of Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, 167 uh, AD, uh, BC, you know, he, he brought a pig into the then Jewish temple, desecrated it that way, and then set up a, an altar to Zeus, actually a statue of Zeus, and put his head on the statue. It's crazy, and he was worshipped. So the Antichrist is going to do something similar. The Bible calls it an abomination or an abomination that brings desolation. That is, that it, it, the presence of God left the temple over that, the Old Testament. So again, he calls it the abomination of desolation. Once, that, once that's set up, there's a three and a half years left, and there's a part of that that Jesus called in Matthew 24 the Great Tribulation, and it's hell on wheels. I mean, it's believer, Christians are persecuted, Believers are persecuted. A lot of Christians in America believe that the rapture of the church is going to happen right around the time of that peace treaty. And if you believe that, I respect you, I love you, but I disagree with you. I believe that for most of my Christian life until 2010 when God changed me. But what I've seen in Scripture for the last 10 plus years, after I've studied it out, researched it, cried before God, etc., is that we're probably going to be here more than likely and we'll see the reign of the Antichrist, the the, the peace treaty, first three and a half years, this abomination of desolation, and then the great tribulation. We'll see some of that. How much that affects the U.S., we don't yet know. It's according to what our leadership chooses to do. If our leadership chooses to go the way of the one world global ideology like most of the world's trying to do, then, then it could affect us and we would have to resist that and we would have to say no to a lot of things. So get ready to say no. Because if you go with the culture, you're going to be messed up. How many hear me? Nonetheless, um, so what it says here, from the time of the abomination of desolation with the Antichrist, he basically turns against Israel and Christians. It's going to be three and a half years. That's 1,260 days. But it mentions here... Um, 1,290 days. It adds 30 days to it. So, so there's seven trumpets. We've talked about this in detail. Seven trumpet judgments, Revelations 8 and 9. Those uh, trumpet judgments, the last trumpet, uh, Revelation chapter 11, that ends that seven-year period. There's an additional 30 days. We've talked about this in detail over the last uh, uh, period of time that we've talked about the other chapters of the book of Revelation and then and then uh, this th- during these 30 days, the bowl judgments come. In Revelation 16, where God if, cleanses the earth, at the, the battle at Armageddon happens during that time, yada, yada, yada. The, um, um, the false religious system is judged in Revelation 17. The economic s- system called Babylon the Great, which is against God, it falls in Revelation 18. And then the battle of Armageddon ensues during those 30 days. It's really an intense time on earth. And so, but then verse 12, blessed is he who waits and comes to the, now watch this, the 1,335 days. So he adds an additional 45 days 
to the three and a half years. So you got three and a half years plus 30 days. That's when the bold judgments happen or battle of Armageddon. Then after that, Jesus is back. There's another 45 days. I said all that to say, when you come to Revelation 20, we're into those 45 days. Those 45 days are happening. And that's just before the 1,000-year reign of Christ. So let me say this. There are three groups of people that will enter the 1,000-year reign of Christ. The Latin word is millennium. Uh, milli for a thousand, annum for a year, a 1,000 year reign of Christ. So if you've heard, how many have heard the term the millennial reign of Christ? Raise your hand. How many have never heard that in your life? Raise your hand. It's fair. It's nothing wrong if you haven't. I just want to know. So anyway, the millennial reign of Christ, thousand year reign of Christ, there are going to be three people groups that will enter the millennial reign of Christ. And this is interesting to know. Uh, uh, Israelites that were sealed during that seven year period so they wouldn't die when all the hell breaks loose here, so to speak, uh, they will go into the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Uh, and uh, and, and in, in, in normal human bodies where they marry and have babies. That's interesting. You ever heard that? Interesting, isn't it? What's this? Uh, Non-Christian Gentiles who did not receive the mark of the beast and somehow just eked it out, eked out an existence, you know, during the hellacious times, uh, during the, the wrath of God where the meteorites fall and the atmosphere changes and such. They go through, they come through that seven years into the 1,000-year reign of Christ. So you got a, you've got a group of people who are natural people in natural human bodies. Now think about it. Now it blew me away when I first studied this. This is years ago I studied it. I thought, you've got to be kidding. You mean natural human beings will be in the millennial reign of Christ? Yes. Longevity will come into their bodies. They'll, they'll, they'll live for hundreds of years like the Old Testament people you read about. Because the, cur- because the curse, the effects of it won't be uh, like they are right now. You hear me? It's strange, isn't it? And then, and then, of course, during the 1,000-year reign of Christ, the millennial reign, there will be glorified believers in glorified bodies, bodies like Jesus had when he was raised from the dead, and they will rule and reign with Christ during that 1,000-year process. And, you know, what we're going to be doing? Well, you might be, a, somebody might be chosen to be over the city of Raleigh or Clayton or Smithfield or Selma or Fuquay Verena or Cary. You know, he may choose you and say, I want you to be the mayor. You know, or, or Nightdale, right? You ever thought about it? You're going to rule and reign with Christ. You ever thought about it? You're not going to be playing a harp, drinking sweet tea. You're going to be working. You'll be in a glorified body. You see, we, we think so little. God thinks big. I like the way he thinks, don't you? Now, in my notes, I've got six, six things restored during the millennial reign of Christ. I don't, I'm not covering that. Get the notes and look at it. Six things. I'm going to let you look at that because I want to go right to Revelation 21, 20 verse 1. Can we do that? So look in your Bible now at Revelation chapter 20 verse 1. Here it is. And this is, we're preparing for the 1,000 year reign of Christ. We're in that 45 day period that Daniel talks about. And that's a preparation time, preparing the earth for Jesus 1,000 year reign. There's six things that will occur. They're in the notes. I'm not even going to talk about that tonight. Don't have time. Verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, this is obviously in the spirit realm. This is a real angel. He has a, some kind of a chain in the spirit realm. That's what he says. And so here, John shows what happens right after the battle of Armageddon. Jesus, let me backtrack a minute. Jesus has just won the battle against Satan, against uh, the, the uh, Antichrist, which the book of Revelation calls the beast, and then the false prophet, that is a religious leader that points everybody towards the Antichrist during that seven-year time saying, he, he the man, he's the guy you need to listen to, he's good, he's cool, he's a spiritual guy, and he's a liar too. So Jesus has won his battle against all these guys. And, um, and all that's happened. False religions uh, shown as the great harlot in Revelation 17 have been defeated. And then uh, Babylon the Great, which represents uh, the deception of money and business that leads people away from God. All that is fallen in Revelation chapter 18. And then the Battle of Armageddon has taken place. And the nations have been defeated that have tried to overrun 
Jesus and his rule here. And then Satan has been, uh, has been, um, ha- has been dealt with. So this angel comes, and uh, he's got a chain in his hand. This is not the first time this angel from the bottomless pit is mentioned. Listen, that oversees it. Revelation 9, 1 and 2. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. Now this time, this star is talking about, here's an angel. Uh, to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now, there is a place called the bottomless pit. Don't know, know a whole lot about it in Scripture. Must be a pretty nasty place. Demons come out of it and mess with people during that seven-year time, during the latter part of it. And it says, And smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Verse 2, Revelation 20, it says, He laid hold of the dragon. So that angel of the bottomless pit who's got a chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. When we come back next time, we'll talk about him being released at the end of the 1,000-year reign. Some things you, you can glean from this. You know, you have questions that arise. Why would God allow Satan free reign on the earth for these millennia of time? Why wouldn't he dispossess Satan of the authority that he has to steal, kill, and destroy? Why? Because God, God has to be just and fair in everything he does. God is just to us, but God is also just to in his enemies. If God didn't treat Satan Fairly and justly, you've got to understand Satan is a dignitary whether you like it or not. Uh, he was in heaven and he was a main ruler in heaven and he defied God, took a third of the angels. Uh, uh, Revelation 12 seems to indicate from heaven they fell to the earth with him. And God has to recognize that even though he disagrees with Satan, he's got to be just towards him. So he can't just use his almighty power and just you know, do away with him. He's got to do it legally or, or God would be imperfect. And God is absolutely pure. And he's absolutely just and absolutely right in everything that he does. And nobody can say anything against his pureness, his fairness, and his holiness, not even Satan himself. The, I don't know about you, it g- gives me great respect to love a being like that. It gives me respect for my Father God. He's not like these gods of the pagan cultures in history, you know, that are so full of self-centeredness and avarice and impatience and lust. He's a pure God. And he's worthy of my respect, my adoration, and my obedience. Yes or no? Wow. Anyway, so cast him in the bottom of this pit and shut uh, shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So this is not Satan's eventual end. He's placed in this bottomless pit. Now, he's a spirit being, so he can probably fly around in the air all around that pit. He and the false prophet, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the um, false religious um, person, uh, who is working with the Antichrist is thrown there, along with the Antichrist thrown in that bottomless pit. Satan stays there a thousand years. Now, it didn't say the other two are let out. It says Satan's let out. And we'll read about that later on in Revelation 20. So you just got to understand, during the 1,000-year reign of, J- G- of, of, uh, of Christ, Satan will not be here to create sickness, disease, lack, poverty, and all kinds of ilk and ill with the nations of the earth. He will be bound. So the whole atmosphere. Can you imagine an atmosphere absent of resistance? Can, you can't imagine it, can you? No spiritual resistance. No darkness. No gloom. No melancholy. No depression. No fear. <sighs> wow. That's exciting right there, isn't it? No poverty. Only prosperity. Only health. Only blessing. Can you imagine? That's amazing, isn't it? Well, that's how it's going to be uh, during that time. Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw the thrones. Now watch this. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. 
Now, these thrones here are people from the kingdom of God who have, a, who have positions of responsibility, or you could say authority. I like rather to say uh, responsibility because Jesus said we don't rule like the world rulers rule. We were, we're servant leaders. Everybody say servant leaders. And in the kingdom of God, they'll be servant leaders. They're serving people. If you're leading a business, if you're leading, if you have a business and or, or, or you're in a church, you should be a servant leader. You shouldn't see yourself as a, as a big, pompous person who's overseeing. No, you're a servant to everybody. I serve Victory Church. That's my job. I give my life out. I spill my guts for this place. I pray for you. I study for you. I believe God for you. I'm here for you, right? And our staff team is. They're servant. So anyway, there are people here in the kingdom of God. And, um, and they're sitting on thrones. And those thrones are judging. And they're going to judge angels and the fallen demonic beings that have worked with, uh, with Satan. All of these millennia of time to wreak havoc on humans. Listen to Daniel seven eighteen. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. Uh, even forever and ever. Daniel seven twenty five through 27, listen to this. Uh, speaking of, um, of the Antichrist, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Now that's obviously speaking about the three and a half years when the Antichrist turned coats against Israel and, and, and the great tribulation begins. It's obviously talking about that time. And it says here, but the court shall be seated and they, uh, they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Now that's when Jesus comes back. The battle of Armageddon ensues. And uh, the Antichrist, Satan, the false prophet, all are, are defeated right then. It's talking about that th right there. Verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under, under the whole heaven, listen, shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. Stop, look at me. You don't understand what God's like. He, he, he is amazing. See, see he's going to train us for eternity to rule and reign with him. We're going to rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. You know what that means? He bequeaths to us his responsibility because he trusts you. Question, can he trust you now? See, what we're doing right now is a seedbed for the future. You get it? So, so our obedience to him now shows how much he will trust us in eternity. And it starts with the thousand-year reign of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? So see, most believers, particularly in America, think, I can get saved, live like, live like I want to. God's going to forgive me, love me. In heaven. You are accruing, you are accruing a position in eternity by loving Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and serving people. You may be one of those seated on one of those thrones. Now watch. Everybody with me? His kingdom's ever, everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Wow. No disorder here. And then notice 1 Corinthians 6, 2, and 3. Did you not know the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Then verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? You ever thought about it? How much more things that pertain to this life? What's that saying? Saints. We, it doesn't say who, but it's, it's obviously people that know Jesus. In their glorified bodies, they're going to be seated on thrones. And those fallen angels, the untold millions, perhaps billions of fallen angels, they'll stand before the saints of God and be judged for what they've done to hurt people all through the millennia of time and then be cast into the lake of fire. God's not going to do that. We do it. Is that strange? You ever thought about it? Everybody's quiet. Then look at this. Everybody with me? Then notice this. Let me see where I'm at. I forgot to put the scripture reference down. 
Oh, yeah, verse, I think we're still at verse 4 here. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who have not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. I just got, can I say something? You, you really want to be careful with what's happening right now. There are forces in play worldwide trying to control human behavior and tell us what we can and can't do and force us to do things that we'd rather not do. We'd say in South Carolina, I'd rather not do that. Well, if you'd rather not do it, don't do it. Are you willing to face the consequences if you're choosing not to violate your conscience in something somebody's asking you to do? The Antichrist is going to force his hand and say, you're going to do this. Are you not going, you're not going to be able to spend your money? You can't buy food? You can't pay your mortgage? You can't pay your insurance? What you going to do? Well, if I got to live under a tree and let a bird feed me the way he fed Elijah, so be it. But if you can't deal with what we're dealing with now, you probably won't, you probably won't resist then. That went over real big. If you had a hard time with this last year, do you hear me? Did everything the government said. Some of it wasn't right. Now, that's not popular. Did you hear what I just said? Some people mad at me because of what I chose to do. I'm not here to please you. I'm pleasing Jesus. Now, you might be upset with my pleasing Jesus, but I promise you, anything I do, I do from my heart. Why? Because in my future... I, I'm going to obey God, come what may. Are you? I mean, really, are you? People will ridicule you when you obey God. Antichrist may come up and kill you. Take your freedoms. Tie your hands, put you in jail. You going to acquiesce? Americans are not ready for what's coming. And we better get ready. The world's not ready for what's coming. Yes or no? It's quiet in this Baptist church. I love Baptists. I'm just joking. It means it's quiet, right? So it says here, I saw the souls of those who were beheaded. That's interesting. That right there shows you life after death. Life beyond death is right there. Those people, they stood before the Antichrist. He said, he said, you take this marker, I'll slit your throat. You renounce Jesus or I'll cut you now, I'll cut your head off now. And you know what they may have said? Start cutting. Jesus loves you. The moment it happens, they're in heaven. I doubt they felt the knife. And they're in heaven. Isn't that awesome? You willing to do that? Before you say amen, you think about it. That's a big deal right there. Right? So it's a clear illustration of life after death. So these people are alive. And the souls of those who have been beheaded for their witness for Jesus, for the word of God, who have not received the beast, the mark of worship, the beast nor his image, had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. They lived and reigned. What does that mean? They got back in their human bodies in a glorified state. This is talking about the resurrection of the dead. Something probably similar to the rapture of the church occurs again. So let me go through this real quickly. Everybody okay? Understand, we've taught this in the past. The rapture of the church, I don't think it's prior to what we typically call the seven-year tribulation. I think it's pre-wrath. The wrath of God doesn't fall during this seven-year period until the last couple of years uh, during the trumpet judgments, Revelation 8. Go read it if you weren't here when I taught it. No, the wrath of God doesn't fall to the very end of it. We're immune from the wrath of God. Jesus took the wrath of God for me. But there's not one scripture that says we're immune from persecution. Not one. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. All that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How many hear me? And we do not like to hear about persecution in America. I don't like to talk about it, but it's in the book. 
And Jesus said, if they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. And he said, you know what? If people defame you and say all kind of nasty things about you because you love me, he said, your name is great in heaven. I don't know about you. I'd rather have a great name in heaven than to be known here. How about you? See, we got it all backwards. Huh? I'd rather not be known here. But when you get to heaven, oh, he's here. Oh, he didn't deny Jesus. Hey, he was persecuted. Yay. And everybody shouts and sings. Right now you go in the room, nobody will look at you. But then, oh, man, there's a big stir because you come in the room. Because you're one of the obedient ones, the faithful ones, the loving ones. Is that good? So again, the rapture of the church pre-wrath. So it looks like the rapture of the church. I'm not going to cover this very, go through this fairly quickly. The rapture of the church during the sixth seal that's broken on the scroll in God's right hand. Revelation 6, 12 through 17 parallels Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Looks like that right there is the rapture of the church because Revelation 7 Right after that seal is broken, the sun is darkened, the moon is darkened, the stars don't give their light, and the earth begins to tremble, 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 tremble and quake. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and that's a sign that Jesus is about to come back. So when you look out and the sun's not shining brightly, the moon and stars don't appear at night, get your ducks in a row and get ready because before you know it, <laughs> You're going up. The rapture will occur. Matthew 24, listen, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Look what God does. He just says, son, tone it down, son. Moon, stop giving you light. Stars, start, stop glistening. He darkens the whole universe. So when Jesus comes back, everybody sees him. What's that light? Is it a comet? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's the Son of God. Woo! That was fun. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. It's the rapture of the church, my friends. During the rapture of the church, all believers, watch this, at the rapture of the church, all believers from, from, all believers from the time of Christ until the rapture will be given resurrection bodies. That means all of the people that have died in Christ. That means the apostle Paul. That means John, the beloved apostle. That means all of those that we read about in the Bible. You can go to 1 Corinthians 16, all of the lists of those Greek believers they're all going to get glorified bodies, all the people in your family that were saved, all through the, all through the two millennia of Christendom. All those, all those dead saints, first of all, will rise from the dead. And then those of us who are still alive during that time, we will not see death. Our bodies will supernaturally change. How quickly? Bat your eye. That's how quickly, right? So let me also say this. When Jesus was raised from the dead, and i got to hurry. Everybody Okay. Matthew 27, 51 says, when Jesus was raised from the dead, when he died, the rocks were rent, the earth quaked. When he rose from the dead, many of the Old Testament saints arose with him and appeared to many in Jerusalem. That was the resurrection of the, of the Old Testament saints who were believing that the Messiah was coming. Their bodies resurrected when Jesus resurrected. That means Abraham, that means Moses, that means Noah, that means Gideon. I mean, name off all the folks you read about in Bible times. All those guys, David, their bodies come up out of the grave. They got their glorified bodies when Jesus got his. He took them out of, he took them out of Sheol. He took them out of Abraham's bosom. They'd been waiting to go to heaven and Jesus said, I'm the, I'm the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Come on with me, boys. And they got their body when he got his. Rapture of the church, all of the believers who have died since Jesus was raised from the dead during the church age will get their glorified bodies. I did my, I can't, every time I think about it, I did my dad's funeral in uh, March of 2012 and I sat there looking at that casket. I watched him throw the dirt on that thing and I kept thinking, my daddy going to come out that casket one of these days. My daddy's body's going to mess up that ground. Something's going to happen. 
I don't know if there's going to be an earthquake or something, but something's going to happen. He's coming up and coming out. His spirit's with the Lord. So here's what happens. What Notice again, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Everybody okay? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the batting of an eye, twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound. This is not the trumpet uh, that has to do with the seven trumpets in Revelations 8 and 9. It's a different one. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Philippians 3, 20 through 21, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. There's something about our faith in God that will cause this mechanism to happen. If we're alive when Jesus comes in the rapture of the church, you're going to be doing your stuff and you, your body will undergo a transformation. You'll probably feel it from the inside out. It will probably be just before the rapture of the church. God will send a signal to every true believer and you'll know on the inside something is about to happen. You may be working. You may be awakened. You may be sleeping. You may be taking care of your children. You may have a day off. You may be in school. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you'll have a signal from heaven that something Something's about to morph. You're about to be transformed and your body will uh, undergo a supernatural change and it'll become like Jesus' body when he was raised from the dead. Now that's really freaky to me, but I'm kind of excited about it because I'm also geeky and I want to know how all this works. So the laws of physics will be set aside and your bodies will change. Isn't that awesome? Bodies made to endure the climate of heaven. Bodies made to transverse the universe. Bodies made to instantly appear and disappear. Bodies that can travel at the speed of thought. You think it, you're there. Woo-hoo. Come on, Father, do it. First Thessalonians 4.13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow with as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. That means those who have died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who were asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel angel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. That's where we get that. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now when we're, when we're raptured, we're not going to be in heaven for eternity. We're coming back to earth. And we'll be with Jesus 1,000 years during his reign. Isn't that Interesting. And then we'll talk about eternity at another lesson. So again, at the rapture of the church, many who have been born again. Now watch this. So the rapture of the church happens. The Antichrist is still here. That three and a half, the rest of that three and a half year period keeps going. That 30 days, the bold judgments, the trumpet judgments, all hell is breaking loose. Terrible things are happening here. There will be people perhaps who are born again during that time. They, they see the error of their way. They miss the rapture of the church. They're going through that hellacious time. Now, here's what you need to think. People that you work with, people in your family, friends that you know, people that live on your street, if they don't know Jesus as Savior and they don't go in the rapture of the church, they're going through some really bad stuff. I mean, the whole climate is going to change. The vegetation dies. The water is polluted. I mean, it's an awful, awful, awful time on planet Earth, and they're going to have to endure that horrible earthquakes. Billions of people will die. I'm not. This, uh, we've, we've talked about this in the past. You don't want your friends and people you know to go through that, so we ought to be sharing Jesus with them. Now, does that mean they're going to ridicule you today in America? 100% yes. They're going to think you looney tunes and crazy. I'd rather somebody thinks I'm loony twos and crazy, but at least knows I'm honest with them and I love them. If you love somebody, how many know you got it? If you know you could save their eternal life, would you do it? Their life in eternity, would you do it? Then why aren't we talking, right? 
So anyway, after, and so uh, uh, during the millennial reign of Christ, the 1,000 year reign of Christ, there will be people who had died during that reign of the Antichrist, that seven year, that seven, well, the, the uh, three and a half years and the, the years after the rapture of the church, they're going to be resurrected and they're going to be somewhat raptured perhaps the way we, we were, you know, in the prior rapture. That's called the first resurrection. You get it? So again, look at Revelation 20, verse 4. We just read that. I saw the thrones. They that sat on them, judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They lived and reigned. They lived. That means they're resurrected. All right, look at verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection, listen to this, it includes those who go in the rapture of the church, the pre-wrath rapture of the church, right when that sixth seal is broken, it includes the first resurrection, includes those people, also includes those two witnesses we read about in Revelation 11 who were, who were resurrected from death there in Jerusalem. There were witnesses during that last three and a half year period. It also, and, and so, and so this, uh, this first resurrection also includes, includes all of the tribulation saints who went through that hellish time, came to Jesus, were born again, and uh, forfeited their lives. Uh, they're going to be resurrected into glorified bodies just like we were in the raptures. Does that make sense? All that's called the first resurrection. How many want to be part of the first resurrection? Well, if there's a first, then there's a second resurrection. So you just got to be aware of this. Now, here's what you got to know, and I'm going to close real quickly here. Um, and this really shocked me when I, when I first saw it. This is the doctrine of, of the resurrection of the dead. All dead people will be resurrected, saint and sinner alike. Why? God created human beings to live in human bodies. Death is unnatural. Death occurred because of sin. God never planned that our human spirits leave our bodies in death. That's the reason we recoil against death. I've been with people as a pastor uh, who are close to death, and it's an odd time. Many people are, you know, ill at ease because, and you try to hang on. I mean, you just don't want to leave. I've had to tell people, if you just let it go, you'll be okay, because it was, it was obvious they were going to go, and they just needed to release it. But you fight against, why do you fight against death? Because God wants you in that body. He created you to live in your body for eternity. Sin messed up his plan. So see, God's going to fulfill his plan for humans. One of his plan for us is that we're going to live in a human body for eternity, and you will. Believers will get glorified God, bodies that smell good. But see, the converse is true. The second resurrection, that's after the thousand years. Anybody that doesn't know Jesus as Savior when they die, they get back in the body, but it's a nasty body. That's a stinky body. It's a corrupted body. It's not new, and it ain't nice. It's not even nice to talk about, is it? Listen to this, and I'm almost done. John 5, 25, Jesus said it, most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given authority to execute judgment also because he's the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, verse 28, John 5. For the hour is coming in which all in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Now, that doesn't mean soul sleep. Some people believe that uh, people are dead and they're in the graves. When I go to Europe, See, people, I mean, you wouldn't believe how clean the graveyards are, the cemeteries, because they believe the souls of the people are still there. And so, I mean, every day they clean the leaves up, they pull the weeds, they got flowers everywhere. It's beautiful because they think the person's still there. That's not what Scripture teaches. And so when it says here, when Jesus said, all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. What does that mean? That means when Jesus comes back at the rapture of the church, their spirit's in heaven. Maybe they're carrying a conversation on with somebody in heaven and suddenly, ho, ho, see you later. 
their spirit goes from heaven right down to where their graveside is and they get back in their glorified body. And they come up. You see it? Wow. Isn't that something? Notice what he said. Hour is coming and all in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. That's the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil. Now there's a span of time between the two. There's the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. That includes the Old Testament saints. They, they incurred the resurrection of life when Jesus was raised, right? Then the, then the believers at the rapture of the church... Uh, the, those who died in Christ, they had the re- that's the resurrection of life. And then those at the very end, at the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus who endured and got saved during the tribulation, you know, they get resurrected. That's the first resurrection, right? But there's a second resurrection right here. And Jesus called it the resurrection of condemnation. They're going to hear his voice. Now, what does that mean? That means at the very end of that 1,000-year reign of Christ, Jesus is going to say it again. Come up. And all who are in the graves will hear his voice. No one, no, 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 no Christians are there. No believers are there. But those who have died in their sins and they're in hell, their spirits will come from hell and will reunite with a corruptible body. That will never be nice. Daniel 12, 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. That's the first resurrection. And those who have done, uh, I'm sorry, everlasting life, and then some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's the second resurrection. Hmm. Job 19, 25, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at the last, at the last. And after my body has decayed yet in my body I will see God that's strange isn't it revelation 20 13 we'll look at it later the sea gave up the dead who were in it death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to his works the great white throne judgment of God all of the unsaved of all time will stand before God Their bodies will have been resurrected, corruptible as they are. Their spirits came from hell. Their bodies came from the ocean or they came from wherever they are. And I know some of you wondering, well, what if somebody got decimated or, you know, in a fire and and, and their bodies disappeared? What What about cremation? You know, God's able to put all that together somehow. How many believe it? What about, you know, somebody gave their eyes away, gave their kidneys away, gave their heart away, gave, well... I don't know. I just know they're going to get back into a corruptible body. Bottom line, everybody's going to live in a human body for eternity. How many want a good one? How many want a nasty one? How many want one that smells good? Huh? How many want a nasty body with one eye hanging out and your tongue hanging? No. You get what I'm saying. Revelation 26, as I conclude, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years isn't that awesome eyes not seen ears not hers not entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for us the second death there will be people perhaps you know them now perhaps God will look at them and say depart from me you lawless ones who did not obey me, didn't accept the sacrifice of my son into the lake of fire produced for the devil and his angels. It's odd to me that the church in America rarely talks about eternal judgment. And our main mission is to keep people out of hell and to populate heaven. Where are you? You going to heaven? Are you living right? Maybe you're listening to me on Facebook and laughing. Somebody will have the last laugh. You know Jesus? Is your name written in the book in heaven? 
Will you experience the first resurrection? Or will you experience the second death? Any person that experiences death without Christ has no hope in life. Nobody can pray you out. Nobody can give money and get you out of any place in hell. There is no chance beyond this life to make things right. You you need to do it now. How many hear me? So Lord, we just take a moment as we conclude tonight. Lord, we pray for those that don't know Jesus. Out of the almost 8 billion people, how many are born again? Estimates are maybe 2 billion. Means there's 6 billion that don't know you. Lord, use us to draw them. Use us to love them. Use us to share Jesus with them. And use us to share words when we need to. Let them see our lifestyle. Lord, draw every person under the sound of my voice in this room and is watching now or sometime later. Draw us to you. Give us a heart to obey you and shun the things that would hinder your best. We give thanks. In Jesus' name.